what's going on guys so this just showed up in the mail I'm not gonna do a uh, unboxing but <laughs> um, this is the upgraded harmonic damper for the 4200 you can see looks pretty similar to the original as you can see it down there so when I say upgraded what does that mean so it's SFI approved so I can avoid a little bit of um, headache at the drag strip since you're supposed to have those below uh, uh, I think below 1099 you're supposed to have an SFI damper so there's that but also this damper came with a study um, a study that BHJ the people who made this damper a study that they did to um, basically examine the Vortec 4200 and why does it have harmonic issues at just over 6000 RPMs and is there a way to tune that out with a harmonic damper so I wanted to talk about um, the types of imbalances as I understand them I mean I'm a EE by uh, schooling so electrical engineer so I'm just gonna try to explain it how I understand it and if there's any uh, uh, harmonics engineers or people who do that sort of things uh, they can uh, obviously correct me but this is how I understand it so I saw a lot of comments when I originally posted about this build that only GM could build a inline six cylinder with a first order imbalance and my response to that is you're just you're wrong it, it's it's not a first order imbalance so what is a first order imbalance I'm gonna go to a LS that I have uh, taken apart at the moment and kinda talk about what that is and as I understand it so alright so the way that BHJ did their study is they did a simulation they essentially examined a uh, Vortec 4200 crankshaft got all the masses and that sort of thing and uh, you know they could estimate on the uh, material properties and that sort of sort of thing and they could guesstimate how this this crankshaft would react. Now obviously this is a LS crankshaft and um, you know it, it's a little different obviously the six cylinder is only going to have one one uh, uh, connecting rod per uh, journal per rod journal so it's a little easier to model and I'm sure they have more complex models for that the V8s and stuff so alright first order imbalance so a rotating mass naturally wants to rotate around the center of mass so a first order imbalance has to do with this rotating mass um, being imbalanced so i.e. the the center of of mass is at a different spot than the center of rotation so it's an inline six cylinder it, it doesn't have that it, it's just it doesn't have that <laughs> so and their study uh, proved that so next is sex second order imbalance so second order imbalance has to do with torsional rigidity so if you think about if my connecting rod is sitting on here now I apply a force to this crank throw it's going to physically rotate you know there's going to be a shock wave the rest of it's going to be sitting still but when you apply a force it, it applies a shock wave to the rest of the system that transfers throughout the rest of the crankshaft it it kinda goes like this a little bit and then the rest of the crankshaft catches up and goes with it it's kinda like a torsion bar so if you think about it if you have you know say this guy's going like this 
and further down the line as time goes on you have another crank throw that's also going like this these two are making waves and if you think about it like say you and your friend are jumping on the trampoline and if you you jump at the right time and you uh, time it just right you can send him even further into the sky but if you also time it slightly differently you can completely stop him so at certain speeds you know this is traveling at different speeds the the ignition events are are happening at different frequencies as the engine increases in speed the you know these these rotations these uh, vibrations will happen at different um, relations to each other and they'll add you know at some points at some points they'll cancel each other out and at some points they'll add together so it's when they add together that's the problem so this this engine doesn't suffer from a second order imbalance either what it does suffer from is a third order imbalance so if we think about a crankshaft in an engine if we look at this guy here so if you think about it you know I have this rotating crankshaft the net force is going to be this way and there's going to be different ignition events that are in sequence and because of the firing order on an inline six cylinder the crankshaft is going to be doing waves like this and that's third order imbalance so what the study found was that because of the firing order which is the same as any other inline six cylinder because that's how um, it best worked out to get the least imbalance because the engine is so long this this crankshaft is going like this and eventually these waves add together and it just wants to shake itself to pieces so what we have here since okay if you think about a wave you know a, a wave um, at its very basic point as the wave increases in frequency the wavelength gets shorter so this wavelength um, you know it depends on the properties of the material how fast it travels through that material you know it, it travels through this material at different um, speeds depending on the material so it just so happens that um, any engine, any inline six, would experience this. Now, and it, like an, a 2JZ or an RB26 or something like that, where they're relatively short engines, the frequency of the engine has to get to a a certain point, um, to a a uh, such a high frequency for it to experience this imbalance because the crankshaft's so short that the firing order it doesn't it doesn't um, affect them but add to that the 4.2 liter has a four inch stroke which puts a lot more force on the crankshaft so <laughs> essentially what you have is is since the crankshaft on a 4.2 liter is so long the frequency that it has to get to where these waves start adding together is so so much smaller than an RB26 that we see it right around 6000 RPMs so a harmonic damper if you think about it you know your spring on your car if you have a spring it's going to oscillate at a certain frequency as you go over bumps and then you have a shock absorber which slows that down it applies force that's proportional to the velocity of the suspension so a harmonic damper works in the same way so you have this internal mass which is connected to the center of the crankshaft and then you have this external mass which has a uh, is isolated from the internal part 
using um, rubber or epoxy in this case I believe it's epoxy of some sort so um, I could see it earlier hang on let me see if I can find it um, I believe this seam right here is right where it rotates around so there's there's rubber between or or some sort of material um, between this outer mass and this inner mass so what this this outer mass does is it acts as a shock absorber it it tries to dampen the harmonics and based on the thickness of that rubber between the two you can tune it for different frequencies so what BHJ has done is using simulation they've tuned this harmonic damper for a different speed and therefore they're able to tune out the bad harmonics in the 6000 RPM range and push it up into like 7000, 7500 range so I, they gave me all sorts of plots and stuff and I'll plot, uh, I'll show you guys that and it's, it's kinda neat so um, yeah I'll, I'll show you that and, and then I'll send you on your way <laughs> alright alright guys so here's the study that I was talking about so um, you can see BHJ did the uh, torsional crankshaft study um, LL8 that's the GM designation for the Vortec 4200 done back in 2013 so it talks about all kinds of stuff like things to consider and how they did their simulation and that sort of stuff but what we care about is all the way here towards the bottom so this is the um, it, it, you can think about the y-axis here as the um, the magnitude of the vibration and our x-axis is obviously engine speed so you can see here that there's a very large peak at just above 6,000 rpms so this plot is of the same same test but with their um, improved damper so notice the x-axis um, the scale has changed but you'll notice that it pushes that peak to past 7,000 rpms so um, that's essentially what this this harmonic damper is doing um, now you'll notice that there's some slightly higher peaks here um, at lower RPMs, that's the compromise. So um, you you have less damping at lower points, but you have more damping at the point we really care about. So kind of interesting. But they also experimented with making a damper that um, is tuned for an even higher frequency. But the um, I guess they considered the um, lower peaks to be too high, so um, I guess they didn't proceed with that. And then they also, um, somewhere here, oh, okay, this is, um, this is assuming a 600 horsepower engine, um, what the peaks would look like with their improved damper, their 300 hertz damper, um, the one that I have. This is what the vibration profile looks like. So this is this is pretty real as to what we're going to be doing. So it's 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 amazing that somebody would would put this time and and money into um, into this engine. I mean, it's really amazing to me. I mean, yeah, the the. <laughs> Harmonic damper was five hundred and twenty-five dollars, so there is that. But it, it's, you know, that's that's a little high for a harmonic damper. But 
for a less common engine, that's actually kind of reasonable. I mean, if you look at like a CTSV, the harmonic damper on one of them is right around $500. So um, it's just super interesting to see um, the kind of time and uh, investment. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure what that plot is, but yeah, this, this plot is what we care about. So just thought I'd show that to you guys. Um, I, I think it's extremely interesting and, uh, um, my plans are to put the harmonic damper onto the engine that's in the car and it, it's very clear from the dyno sessions that, um, we're not going to make any more power by revving it. So let me pull up a dyno graph. Okay, so I finally found a dyno graph. So you can see here, it's kind of leveled off. Um, now, my only hopes for um, possibly making more power with RPM was the VVT. And recently, that's, that's given me a lot of trouble. Um, I've been playing with, around with all the settings. I thought I had it working, but I just, man, I am, I am at a loss. So I was actually um, considering taking the car to Matt again this weekend, thinking I had the VVT working, um, and I was going to install the damper and take it to 7K and, and see what it does, but it's, it's just not worth it to me anymore. Um, since I can't get the VVT to work and it I really don't think it's going to be worth much power anyways just because it's on the exhaust cam and not on the intake cam everything I've read says that that's the wrong cam and um, so it, I we're still going to take the uh, Nova this weekend which I'll, I'll uh, give you guys an update on that pretty soon here but um, yeah, so um, I really don't think revving it to 7K is going to help. Now, where it could help is on a 2006 and later engine that has bigger cams and bigger valves, so more airflow. So that could really benefit from uh, uh, revving to 7K. Now, I'm not, you know, yeah, that study was nice, but... I would still like to test it on something that I'm okay if it blows up. Yeah, I don't want the the engine that's in the car to blow up, but if that were to blow up, it, it would break my heart less than uh, having the uh, 08 engine blow up. So we're still going to install it on the engine that's in the car. We're going to take it to 7000 and see if it lives, <laughs> and then uh, move on with life. So, um, at some point we'll put the 08 engine in it and it'll really, really come to life and probably take it to Matt again. And, uh, so yeah. All right. I'm gonna hit, hit the, hit the hay <laughs> and, uh, I'll catch you guys in the next one.